Hello, everyone. I'm Ian Fairley. I'm speaking to you from London, in England, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and I'm going to be talking about um, uh, on the 36th anniversary of Chernobyl, talking about what actually happened 36 years ago. Um, Lynn asked me to introduce myself. Maybe I better explain who I am. Um, I'm a Scot, um, but I'm also Canadian. And um, I have degrees in chemistry and radiation biology. Um, and I've worked for the British government as a uh, scientist um, in, for the Department of Environment for about eight years, I suppose. Um, but that was quite a while ago. So, um, and, and uh, to fill out my CV, I also was a campaigner working for Greenpeace Canada many years ago as well. So, um, rather, uh, how shall I put it, uh, cosmopolitan background. <laughs> Ian, are you speaking very directly into your microphone? I think I think your sound isn't too bad, but some people are finding it a oh. little muffled. Oh, right. Okay, is that better? I want thumbs up, please. Is that better? I think it might be. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry yep. about that. I am. Um, I'm lifting up. Um, I'm not actually sure where the microphone is on this laptop, um, but I'm hoping that's better now. Okay. Right. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, without further ado, I'm going to talk about what happened back in April 26, 1986. There was a huge explosion at reactor number four of the <clears throat> Chernobyl nuclear power complex. And as you can see from this picture here, the, the reactor, which normally would be right here, um, exploded. And the graphite inside the reactor, 1,600 tons of it, burned for 10 days, lofting huge amounts of radioactivity into the atmosphere, and which blanketed, as you will see, Europe, <laughs> Want to put your slides on slideshow mode, Ian? Okay. Sorry. Um. <coughs> right. Um. If people can't see this, I'm, I'm not sure whether people can or not, but this is what happened. Where my cursor is, is, is Chernobyl. And this was on what happened on <clears throat> April 26th. The next one here it was what happened two days later on April the 28th. Here on April the 30th. Here on um, May the 2nd. Here May the 4th. Here May the 6th, if I remember rightly. I may have got these two mixed up, but anyway, not to worry. The key point being that. Um, you can see that the weather pattern scattered the, the fallout from Chernobyl all over Europe. Um, and the result is this. This is a map prepared by the European Commission back in 1996. And what they did was that they ran a helicopter with um, uh, a radiation monitoring device um, about 50 meters above the surface of the whole of Europe. It took them a couple of years to do this. And you can see that much of Europe was contaminated. This legend here shows you the um, ground concentration of cesium-137 in kilobacks per square meter. You can see that Finland got it, Sweden got it, Britain got it, Austria got it, and the three countries of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia really got it. Now, most people are not aware of this map. They're not aware of the fact that much of Europe was contaminated. In fact, about 40% of the land area received 
above 50 kilobytes per square meter from, in other words, the orange, deep orange and red here, 40%. So this is quite serious contamination. And many people are not aware of the fact that this contamination reached Britain. It certainly did. And this map here <clears throat> shows you the contamination um, reaching Britain on May the 1st and May the 2nd, 1986. Um, generally speaking, the, the fallout followed the rainfall patterns. And because Scotland really was badly affected, here's a map, a, a closer map, showing that southwest Scotland and the Highlands and the Lothians really were very badly contaminated. These are quite high levels, unfortunately. Um, this map here shows what happened in the uh, nearer the power station. Where my cursor is, is the actual Chernobyl, Chernobyl nuclear power station. The solid black lines are the borders, national borders of here, Ukraine, here, Belarus, and here, the Russian Federation. In other words, uh, the contamination from Chernobyl here, Chernobyl here, affected all countries. This is a map of Belarus showing very high levels of contamination. Chernobyl is here, Chernobyl is here. This is Ukraine, Chernobyl is here. And the previous map for all of cesium. This map is of iodine-131, and this, this one is not so widely publicized. Um, Chernobyl, Chernobyl was about roughly here, and as you can see, the contamination was mainly in Eastern Europe, but, uh, but um, Austria got it, and so did uh, the Czechoslovakia as well. Um, these are some of the effects. Um, this is data from uh, compiled by uh, the Belarus government and the Ukrainian government, showing the total number of thyroid cancer cases um, in Belarus in blue and Ukraine in uh, purple. Um, and these are the dates. Uh, the the x-axis is number of cases per 100,000 population. I just need, I should have put that in, but there we go. Um, um, as you can see that the it was relatively flat for the first two or three years, and then it really took off. Um, in other words, it was an epidemic of thyroid cancer in the two countries. This is a more detail, <clears throat> the same figures. Um, <clears throat> the red and the blue are women, and the blue and the dark blue and the yellow are men, um, showing that women are, roughly speaking, about four or five times more radiosensitive than thyroids are than women, particularly girls, by the way. My conclusions from this are that, um, and these are from my own studies, um, which I wrote in 2006 and 2016, respectively on the 20th and 30th anniversary of Chernobyl, where the, <clears throat> there were approximately 60,000, very difficult to be more precise than that, uh, cancer cases um, in Europe, um, which is about 15 times more than what the IAEA published. They, they reckon it would be 4,000. Of those 60,000 cancer cases, there were 18,000 thyroid cancer cases. Um, Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia, B-U-R, are their initials, were very heavily contaminated. About half of Chernobyl's fallout was deposited outside those countries, though. Most people are not aware of that. Although they were the, the, the three main countries were, were contaminated, um, about half of the total fallout was deposited outside those three countries. And Chernobyl, in fact, I calculate that 
Chernobyl contaminated about 40% of the land area of Europe. Now, that's the, um, the hard data. Um, just let me speak a little bit more about um, what I've done since then. Um, I was commissioned by the Austrian government back in 2016 to prepare a report on what actually happened um, after Chernobyl and how um, it affected, particularly how it affected Austria, obviously. But um, I looked at the whole data and it was quite clear that there was a huge variety, a whole gamut of health effects. It wasn't just uh, thyroid cancer cases, it was solid cancer cases, breast cancer cases, a lot of leukemias, a lot of um, lymphomas, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas especially. There were a lot of childhood illnesses. There were a lot of congenital malformations, a lot of birth defects. And um, these are all available on my website if you go to my website and type in Chernobyl. But I think that um, there's, people will probably ask me, what is the best um, guide to watch what actually happened at Chernobyl? Because it's not just horrible health effects, it's also um, what I would call um, the litany of lies, that, uh, untruths that came out from the Soviet Union between 1986 and 1990, when, when it finally dissolved. Um, there's, in, in last year, I think it part, maybe 2020, there was a five-part series put out by HBO Stroke Sky called Chernobyl, just that word, Chernobyl, which won um, a whole raft of um, uh, cinematography awards and movie awards. And I would recommend getting that. It's very good. It's, um, it's the best thing that I've seen on Chernobyl. Um, uh, the acting is very good. Um, they have taken a, one or two slight liberties, but are, that's just basically to get the story across because it's a huge story. And in general, I, they were very faithful to what actually happened. A couple of points that came out of that is that the accident itself took place uh, at one, roughly speaking, 1.30 in the morning in, uh, in the Ukraine. And the, um, which immediately rang alarm bells with, and everybody who knew about it. Why did this happen at 1.30 in the morning? Because generally speaking, what happens is that um, power, nuclear power stations have great difficulty at nighttime because they keep, they're trying to ramp down um, and put out less output because everybody's asleep. They don't need the electricity. And so they try and reduce the output. But this causes great difficulties and isn't easily done. And as, according to what I've read, um, and in my own view, this was not just a test, as we use the word test. It wasn't a test. This was um, a direct result of an order from Moscow to Chernobyl or Chernobyl to reduce their output. Um, and as a result of that, the explosion occurred. And basically, they lost control of the reactor. Um, but the, the thing is that a number of scientists in Russia um, tweaked this right away. And um, including the, the scientists who were sent to Chernobyl from Moscow to try and figure out what to do to try and deal with the situation. And when it became painfully clear what had actually happened, a number of the scientists committed suicide because they, they realized that um, their dream, and they all believed in nuclear power, their dream was dissolved, basically. They couldn't, and that um, they couldn't live with all the lies that came out. All this is very, 
very well portrayed in the HBO Stroke Fox series, Chernobyl. Um, very moving and, and in my view, very accurate. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. Right, okay, Ian. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So we'll take some immediate questions. Um, and as I said, we will end up having a more general discussion, but um, perhaps there might be some immediate questions for Ian. And I see that there's been a couple of notes in the chat from people from parts of Scotland or parts of England where uh, livestock, um, lamb, uh, I know uh, sheep farmers are very affected. Livestock yes. couldn't be sold for more than 10 years in some parts of the UK. I think it was about 12 years in the end um, before uh, uh, lamb in some areas was declared fit for you know, human consumption again um, because the grass kept re, in, you know, the grass was still sufficiently contaminated the soil into the grass, into the, into the animal. Yes, can I can I add something there? Yes, of course. Um, I was actually working for the government at the time that this happened. When uh, what happened, I worked for the Department of Environment, and they had to test the lambs in Cumbria and in North Wales um, for cesium contamination. And much to their surprise, they thought that the cesium would um, go into the earth and uh, steadily drift um, further and further deeper into the soil and it didn't happen. What happened was that the roots kept bringing up the cesium to the surface and so when the sheep ate the, um, the produce, ate the, um, the, the green plants, they became contaminated and the contamination levels, if anything, were going up. And this um, lasted them until 2012 when what, um, this sounds crazy, but it's true. When the government was planning to build more nuclear power stations and it couldn't have really the, this bad news going on of um, continued cesium contamination in lands. So what did they do? They shifted the score posts and made the acceptable level a little bit higher so that people could um, eat more the amount of radioactivity in the food could go and be increased and still be sold. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, so any questions? I see Margaret, you've put a comment. Margaret Forbes has put a very sad comment in the chat about the loss of her husband to blood cancer. Um, oh dear which she thinks may have, that Chernobyl may have had a role in. That's one of the terrible things about cancers is it's always, it's never possible to trace exactly, or it, only in very rare circumstances is it possible to trace exactly where it's come from, which has uh, been used repeatedly by the nuclear industry to deny the connection between leukemia clusters around nuclear facilities and childhood yeah. leukemia. Yeah. Yeah, it's um I'm sorry to hear um um sad news, but um you it, it is, as Lynn says, really, really difficult. If you want to write to me and send me an email with more details, I'm quite willing to um uh, give you a more considered reply, but that's the best that I can do right now. Um, so let's see. There's some other questions here. Um, Roger Horn, do you want to ask your question yourself? And oh, Pete, sorry, I didn't see you. Um, Pete, since you've got your hand up, do you want to go first and, and then we'll turn mm. to Roger? Yes. Um, I noticed from the news recently that um, some of the Russian soldiers that had invaded Chernobyl were thought to have been taken to a medical facility in Gommel. I, and I wondered if that 
facility was set up for, for specifically after 1986 um, because Gommel was so badly hit. And uh, perhaps Ian would like to remind us of the story that Kate Brown told us about why Gommel was so um, so badly contaminated. It's quite a long way from Chernobyl and uh, it seems to be an isolated point on the map where where the radiation is particularly high. Um, hi, Pete. Are you talking about the, um, the seeding of the plant uh, of the air with uh, dry ice? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, for those people who don't know, what happened was that when the um, between April the 26th and May the 8th or so, when the plant was still spewing out vast quantities of radionuclides into the atmosphere, um, um, the apparatchiks in, um, in Moscow were terrified that the the clouds were drifting towards Moscow. We've got a population of five million, and uh, they um, were very very worried about that. So, what they did was they sent up planes to seed radioactivity with dry ice, and that um, caused it to rain over Gomel, and that's why the concentrations in Gomel are so high. In other words. Um, the um, the Soviet government decided that it was all right for it to fall in Belarus, but um, they were not going to have it fall in Russia and in particular Moscow. That's the kind of you may gather from me that I I'm not a particular fan of Russia. Well, you're absolutely right. I have never been a fan of Russia. The amount of lies that came out of Chernobyl. And it's still going on right now. Um, but uh, we're not here to talk about that. No. Um, but anyway, um, that's what happened. It's terrible. Yeah. Whilst I got the floor, um, one of the questions that I, from a guy called Roger there that I saw on the screen, Roger asked whether the difficulty with uh, nighttime production of nuclear power is still a difficulty. Well, the answer, Roger, is not really here in Britain. And the reason why is because um, the number of nuclear power stations has steadily declined and declined and declined. It used to be that Britain got about 25% of its electricity from nuclear. Now it's down to about 12, 13%, maybe even less than that. So it's not a problem, but it is a problem in France where they get 75% of their electricity from nuclear power stations. And at nighttime, what EDF has to do is to ship it um, to all its neighbours, in other words, to Belgium, to Germany, to Switzerland, to Italy, to Spain, and to Britain. Um, all the excess energy that it, it cannot use in France, and it ships it at very, very cheap prices, so huge losses. Because, of course, all these countries know that they've got France over a barrel, and they can more or less pay as little as they want. And they do, including Britain. It's also been said even here that sometimes wind turbines have to be switched off because the grid can't cope with excess capacity and you can't easily power down nuclear power stations. So even if we've only got one, sometimes maybe wind power has to be turned off because it can't be. Yeah, um, that's true. Um, um, although um, batteries are being built now, to um, absorb the energy of which is being created. Not quickly enough, of course, but, um, but that is true. There is, in, in Britain, there's one nuclear power station still in Torness in Scotland, and there's about five others still yep. power stations in England. Kyle, um, sorry, Ian, I'm gonna bring in Kyle, He's, who's got his hand up, and then we'll go to Linda's question, which is in the chat. <clears throat> Kyle. Hi, yes. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk more about the actual cause of the accident. Uh, I think the common consensus is that there was a, a test going on. And uh, would you put it down to human error or a technological error? And if it was technological, would the advancement in technology today 
not make nuclear power more safer. <clears throat> Thanks. Well, um, that's a nice simple question, but the answer is very complicated and long. Um, let me say right away that um, um, that many pro nuclear people um, very strongly adhere to the their belief that this was um, um, a human error, not a technological error. Um, it was a mixture of both, to be honest. Um, in the sense that the reactor was um, had a design it's called a, um, a positive void coefficient, which means basically you have a runaway reaction when things start going wrong. And that's exactly what happened. Um, that's an uh, RBMK reactor. Um, and you could um, correctly point out that all the other reactors in the Soviet Union, most of the other reactors, the ones that are still running are of a different type. That's very true. Um, but um, I think that um, arguing that the technology is different and better and safer, uh, that's, a, that's a difficult one. Um, I mean, if you look at the reactors in uh, Japan, for example, Fukushima, they were all that kind. And they, did, they, all, they didn't have positive void coefficients. But of the three reactors running at Fukushima, they all exploded and they all had meltdowns. So it's tricky. Technology, uh, um, I think that um, we as members of the public, um, we should take a more uh, general look, a step back, and take the view that nuclear technology is always dicey, it's always tricky, it's always on the verge and there's been about four major accidents big accidents that have happened about once every 10 years or so and and i think that well if you speak to nuclear engineers they know that it's likely that there will be a big reactor uh, accident about roughly once every 10 15 years or so and i take that point on as well okay could or that's that's a rather um, off the cuff response, but it's 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 a tricky question to. You could write a book about. Right. Yeah, question. we'll probably come back to this perhaps. But yeah. Ian, um, Linda uh, has asked. Linda Penskunter has asked a question. Can you talk a bit more about the uneven distribution of the fallout? Um, was this due to where it was raining at the time? Clearly, there are hotspots quite far from Chernobyl. So your your answer has maybe already said that in the sense yeah. that I think it yeah. is linked to rainfall. The answer is yes. It is basically due to rainfall, um, but not completely. I would say maybe sixty five percent is from um, washout from the radioactive fallout from the radioactive clouds that were going over. But there's also a phenomenon of dry fallout where the particles just fall out from the air. Um, so it's both. Um, but the predominant one is rainfall, yes. Yeah.